All right, Colorado. I think I'm ready for this. Okay, so two days later, so kind of got a little busy. Um, the dock project we're working on was supposed to originally have four people filming, uh, but we are down to two. So we're both a little bit overwhelmed. Um, Andrew is working as not only camera operator, but also location manager and first AC. And I'm filling director, director of photography, and DIT roles, which is definitely getting a little overwhelming. Uh, pretty much 6 a.m. till about midnight each day we've been up and it's been non-stop work on the dock. Right now I'm uh, just outside Silverton uh, grabbing some shots and getting some audio off the river behind me. I think this is a, a good location to start talking to you guys about exposure. All right so talking about exposure the first thing you understand is that it's known as the exposure triangle for the three parts, the shutter speed or shutter angle, your aperture and your ISO. The three components work together to create the image. Each one impacts lighting in a different way and can impact other components of the image as well. All right, so let's start off with shutter speed or shutter angle. I think the first thing to understand here is that shutter speed and shutter angle are two different things based on what type of shutter your camera has. However, both will impact the image in the same manner. A shutter speed is in reference to a shutter that opens and closes in order to allow light onto the imaging sensor for a specified amount of time, usually measured in a fraction of a second. Your shutter angle is in reference to a shutter that has a circular design and opens up to a certain degree, in other words shutter angle, and allows light to hit the sensor for the duration of that opening as it is spinning around. Now a lot of cameras, uh, mine included, have what are now electronic shutters or virtual shutters. Uh, essentially the electronic imaging sensor will simulate the effect of an actual physical or mechanical shutter. A mechanical shutter can't go beyond 180 degrees, meanwhile an electronic shutter is more than capable of going beyond 180 degrees. Now, the amount of time that light hits your imaging sensor will impact the amount of motion blur in each frame. For this reason, the 180 degree shutter rule has been established as the industry norm for cinematography as the 180 degrees will allow for the most natural looking amount of motion blur in each frame so that things don't look too choppy or too fluid. Now it's important to understand that if your camera does not measure its shutter with angles but rather speeds, you can still achieve the 180 degree shutter rule. This is done very simply by taking your frames per second, multiply it by two. So if you're shooting with 30 frames per second, you want to be shooting with a 1 60th of a second shutter speed. And that continues if you're shooting at 60 frames per second, you want to be shooting with a 1 1 20th of a second shutter speed. It's also very important to note that you can break the 180 degree shutter rule and still get very good, very desirable results. But you have to understand that that does mean that your motion blur is impacted. And again, this can create choppy or fluid visuals. And if you plan it out properly and you have a purpose behind doing so, this can create a very emotionally moving image that might convey the theme or mood of the scene or story better than it does convey reality. 
All right, so now we've covered a bit of shutter, let's go into aperture or your f-stop. Uh, some cameras or rather some lenses will measure this in t-stops. Uh, essentially, it is the same thing. The only difference is a t-stop is something that is actually measured scientifically. It has a specific value. Uh, an f-stop, one manufacturer to the next, might be marginally different. It might not necessarily be the same. Your f-stop measures your aperture, your opening in the lens that actually allows the light into the camera and onto the imaging sensor. The smaller the numerical value of your f or t-stop, so let's say f 1.8, that is a larger opening, more light gets in. A higher numerical value, say f 22, is a smaller opening and allows less light into the camera and onto your imaging sensor. With less light, that smaller opening, the higher f-stop, you can achieve a deeper or larger depth of field, that is, that which is in focus in your frame. The smaller numbers, the f1.8, that big opening again, that will allow for a much shallower depth of field, which is less is in focus. So if you're shooting the Colorado Rockies and you want everything in focus, your objective is to get your f-stop as close to that f22 as you can because that will allow as much of these beautiful Rocky Mountains to be in focus. If your objective, however, is to create some blur, you know, bokeh, on part of the image and have something specific in focus to draw your viewer's attention, you want that big opening, the f1.8 or whatever your lens is capable of. Alright, and finally, let's talk about ISO. Probably the most complicated and maybe most difficult to explain, so bear with me. I apologize if it's somewhat confusing at times. Your ISO is how your camera's sensor interprets light, or how sensitive it is to light. And obviously this works different in film, you have different ISOs of film. Well this is your different ISO for your sensor, and it can be changed. This is also where a lot of the graininess or noise in an image will come in. If your ISO is too high or too low, it will create that grainy texture, the noise, that is, generally speaking, very undesirable. And it's important to understand that your sensor has a native ISO. It is the ISO that the sensor, the processor, and the firmware is all designed to operate at. And at that ISO, the image is cleanest. Now, some cameras, many nowadays actually, have two or even three native ISOs where the sensor is going to operate at its most efficient, cleanest image. So the further you get from that native ISO or native ISOs, the more likely it is that you're going to have a grainy image. It's the balancing of those three aspects, your, your shutter, your aperture or f-stop, and your ISO that allows you to properly expose an image and understanding the problems that each one can bring about and the benefits that they can bring about as well if it's used with intent and understanding. So the shoot here in Colorado, like I said, we're uh, one guy down, actually essentially two guys down. We originally had four for this trip, then it was three, and now we're down to two now that we're actually here. So we're def definitely overwhelmed. Um, this is a project that we wanted to do for the last 21, 22 years. Ever since I first got an interest in film and an interest in trains, this was the project I wanted to do. So that in and of itself is a lot to take in and a lot to tackle. But then coming out here short-staffed, pretty much every night we've been up till midnight or later transferring footage and charging batteries, doing the work of a DIT, after hours because we don't have our DIT in the field now. It's a lot. We've gone through a lot of footage. We've had hard drive failures, but it's coming together. One way or another, this project will be completed and it will be 
everything that we hoped for. Maybe that means a second trip out here is required, I don't know yet. Once we get to cutting and color grading, narrating, uh, then we'll actually find out how this is shaping together for sure. So far, the footage is beautiful for sure, but like I said, we're very much so stretched thin and taxed to our absolute limit out here. But it does, it is good. I think that is necessary for a filmmaker. You need to be pushed to your limits in order to ever grow as a filmmaker. If you're not pushed, you stay stagnant and you never get better. You never get to that dream project. So this is our fifth day on the shoot and our third and final day at Durango. We will be heading to Cumbres immediately after uh, these next few shots. And then it'll be three days of shooting at the Cumbres and Toltec before flying back to Pennsylvania. So this is definitely a long trip, a very exhausting trip, but I think one that is going to yield some pretty amazing results, and I can't wait to share that with you guys. Some on here and 90-some-odd percent of it on Dynamo. Just saying, I have no idea what I'd do without a matte box on this trip. It has saved so many of my shots from the, just the harsh lighting angles. I, I can't honestly remember what it was like before I had one of these things. If you didn't know, it's, it's called a matte box. Super handy. Small rig. Totally recommend it.